Hey, what's up? It's Zach with Root and Branch Group. In this video, we're talking about three ways that Google can help small businesses succeed in 2022. We're going to talk about how Google can help to earn visibility on the SERPs, the search engine results pages, how Google can help to advertise, and how Google can help to measure performance and analyze. We'll start with how Google, Google can help to earn search visibility on the SERPs. But really, first, let's just talk about the whole digital marketing ecosystem and where Google fits in. When we talk about digital marketing, it's just such a massive, massive scope. There's social media, there's web development, there's local SEO, there's search advertising, there's on-site and technical SEO. We have analytics and conversion rate optimization. There's marketing automation with tools like HubSpot and Salesforce. At the middle, at most of this is the big G. And what we're talking about today is going to cover these areas here. Local SEO, search advertising, and analytics. So when we talk about Google, it's really Google's parent company, Alphabet. As of January 25th, it's a $1.7 trillion market cap for Alphabet. And in 2020, $183 billion in revenue from Alphabet, of which 80% of that, $147 billion, came from advertising. So although Alphabet's more than Google, you know, there's self-driving cars in there with Waymo, there's a health, health initiative, it's really about Google. And 2021 actually just released um, early in February, and that was up 41% in terms of 2021 revenue versus 2020. So got revenue to $257 billion, of which more than $200 billion is coming from advertising. And advertising, the big deal there is Google Ads, formerly called AdWords. It's the paid Google advertising platform for search ads, display ads, video ads, shopping ads, remarketing ads. And that, as we can see, over the past years, this chart ends in 2018, but people continue, shockingly, to use the internet and Google continues to make more money. When we think about Google, as we look at the way that sales have grown over the years, we can see Google continues to make more money. People continue to use the internet. Google continues to monetize that. This chart ends in 2018, but you can just see that rapid increase of growth rate. When we think about Google, what does Google want? What are Google's motivations? It's similar to what all search engines are trying to do. When somebody looks for something on the internet, search engines are looking to serve content that is relevant, authoritative, and helpful to answer questions from those users. Why does that matter? It's because search engines are, in a way, they're in the customer service business. Eight, since 80% of Google's revenue comes from advertising, remember $200 plus billion in 2021, Google is highly invested in getting people like you and like me to have a good experience when we search for something in Google. That's going to keep us using the platform and generating revenue for Google. The last thing Google wants us to do is give us a reason to use Bing or Yahoo or DuckDuckGo in the future. All right, so with that kind of helping to set the stage, let's talk about the first way that Google can help small businesses in 2022, the Google Business Profile for local search dominance. So let's talk local search. 5.6 billion. That is the estimated daily search volume on Google. That works out to 2 trillion searches a year. 46% of those searches on Google have local intent. What's a local intent search? Something like Pittsburgh breweries. Coffee near me, or the best pizza in Philly or New York or San Francisco or wherever. Somebody searching for something within a specific geography. 
88% of those local searches on a mobile device result in a call or a physical visit to a business within a 24 hour period. These are searches at the bottom of the funnel. These are searches that are going to turn into money within a day or less. So these are highly valuable searches. And many of these searches trigger something called the local pack on the SERP. The local pack, also called the local three pack. We've got an example of it here on the screen for the search term Pittsburgh breweries. There's the first result there in the local pack. There's the second and there's the third together. The three of them are the local pack and they get a ton of clicks. The first result averages about a quarter of all clicks on the SERP. The second result in the three pack gets just under 14% of clicks. And the third result gets 9.5% of all clicks on the SERP. Taken together, somewhere around 48%, sometimes upwards of 50% of all clicks go to something in the these three results in the three packs. The local pack appears with 93% of all searches with local intent, and it's driven primarily by Google My Business, the Google business listing. So what's new in 2022? Well, Google My Business gets a slight rebrand. It's now called the Google Business Profile. So don't be confused if you see that around, the Google Business Profile. What's not new? It's this platform with the potential to be the most important digital marketing tool for many local businesses. It's my own personal opinion, but I think for a business that has a physical location that serves customers in a given geography, this tool is incredibly powerful. And it's because of how high intent those geo-specific searches are and how important the Google business profile is, is getting businesses into that local three pack. So who it's for? I mean, any business that has that physical location Remember, Google Business Profile is the same engine that drives Google Maps. So business, businesses that show up on Maps, rather than a virtual or a home-based business, they get a leg up. Google wants to prioritize those businesses. Who is it not for? If you're an e-commerce retailer or another business where customers don't really care where you're located, Google doesn't really care that much about you either, at least in the context of the Google Business Listing. Also, if you're a business that generally doesn't seem to want to respond to customer feedback or you don't want to engage with it in a really like helpful way for customers, the Google business profile might not be for you. And that's because getting reviews, responding to both positive and negative reviews in a way that shows customers that you care, it's a really important part of continuing to rank in that local three pack. So if that doesn't sound like you, you're probably not going to get a lot of benefit from the Google business profile. So how to get started. If you haven't already claimed and verified your Google business profile, you should definitely do it now. You can head on over to mybusiness.google.com. You'll see something that looks like this and you'll see that blue manage now button. You can then claim your business. You'll need to verify it through a phone call or a postcard that Google will mail to you. From there, take the next step. Review your primary category to see if you need to make any changes. You should absolutely do this whether you're just in the process of claiming your Google business profile or if you've had a Google business listing for years. You should absolutely look at your primary category. Why? It's the single most important ranking factor within the Google business listing. It is the royalty of ranking in that local three pack. It's the answer to the question, how can I rank for more near me searches? It starts with that primary category. So let's take a look at that just to see how true that is. Let's look at a real business here. We're going to look at a tree trimming business after we have claimed and verified ownership. So within your info section, you'll see this little info area in that red box. 
you want to complete your name, your address, your phone number, your hours, link to your website, your business description, up to 750 characters, your pictures, all of these things are really, really important. That name, address, and phone, by the way, that's an important acronym called NAP, where Google's going to be looking at that to see if it's consistent across all of your directory listings. So do you have the same information in your Facebook page, in your Yelp page, in Apple Maps, etc.? So definitely look at that. But then really look at your primary category and also your additional categories. So here's what that looks like when you're setting it up in the Google business listing. There's your primary category. And for our business here, you can see we've selected tree service. We get to choose from a predetermined list here. We don't get to just write something in free form. But Google has a lot of primary categories to choose from. You get to choose one of your primary category. You can also choose additional categories. You can choose up to 10. So this business, they do landscaping work, they do lawn care, lawn mowing, and tree service. So we chose for tree service to be their primary category for a couple of reasons. One, it's primary revenue driver. Two, it's what's gonna help their business the most if they get more customers for people looking for tree service. So when you think about your primary category, think about not just what's most important to your business, uh, how customers think about you, and you know what's gonna be most meaningful for your bottom line if you get new customers. The primary category, again, the most important factor for ranking. So what overall helps influence whether a business listing shows up in the three pack? Google doesn't share their algorithm information, but this is the result from a survey of people who practice local SEO. What are the top 15 factors influencing whether a business shows up in that local pack? There's number one right there, your primary GMB category. And not too much further down the list, you can see number five is those additional GMB categories. This is helping us in a really big way. All right, so after your listing is live, you can see which search queries are prompting Google to show your listing. You can see that within your insights reporting in your Google business listing. Right there. So if you hit insights, you'll be able to see your searches break down. So let's get back to our tree trimming business, primary category of tree service. You can see here how many of those top searches are directly influenced by that primary category of tree service. I've blanked out anything that would identify the business. You can see number one though, tree service near me. Number two, um, geography name has been removed, but then it says tree removal, tree removal near me, tree trimming near me, seven of the top 10, all coming from that primary category. So what you should do when you look at this report is confirm that the searches you are showing up for are the types of searches you want to invest time in earning. And then reinforce that same keyword theme in review responses, new pictures that you update, business description, etc. You can also check out some other stuff within the insights reporting to see the customer actions that will make your business money. Here's an example here. You can see over the last time period, how many visits from your website did you get directly from your Google business listing? How many customers requested directions on your Google business listing? And how many called you directly from the listing? You can see it right there. And these are not insubstantial numbers. You can see almost 800 direction requests, nearly 1,700 calls over the prior quarter. And if you hit that little drop down next to where it says one quarter, you can also look at the last month. You can change the time frame like that. And then track that over time. What I like to do is once a month I'll go in, just pull out the information, and you can see your lead volume go up as you continue to invest time and care in your Google business listing. So that is the first way that Google can help small businesses in 2022. Number two, Google Analytics for website measurement and analysis. What is Google Analytics? It is a free, usually free, web analytics platform that is found on 87% of the world's top 10,000 websites. If you're a huge enterprise business, you might be paying for Google Analytics because you have additional page processing needs. 
but then of course you're not a small business and you're probably not watching this video. So Google Analytics for you is free. It provides data and insights about web traffic patterns, user behavior, popular pages on your website, and user conversions, things like submitted forms and completed purchases. How does it work? Well, there's a piece of JavaScript code with a unique tracking ID that's inserted into the backend code of your website. This piece of JavaScript allows Google Analytics to collect data about what is happening on your site. The data is then processed and sent to your Google Analytics account which you can access at analytics.google.com, where you can then analyze it and learn more about your customers and your business. Here's what it looks like. That right there is the unique tracking ID that's hidden in the box there, but every other code looks similar. This is a universal analytics code here, but the unique tracking ID is different. So let's check out some of the things we can do with Google Analytics and talk about how we can use that information. You can learn about your website visitors by demographics. This is for the root and branch group website. You can see on the left side that most users, the most popular age demographic is 25 to 34. And if you look on the right side, you can see it's about 60%, just over 60% male. You can learn about your website visitors by what they are shopping for. Google Analytics will show us something called in-market segments. So based on the browsing history and overall web activity of people on your site, um, Google can tell you a little bit more about them, help us learn about them. What are these people in the market for based on their other web activity, things they do when they're not on our website? So for the root and branch site, we do SEO, digital analytics, Google Ads, digital marketing services, so you can see when you, if you sort this in descending order by the most users, number one are people who are in the market for advertising and marketing services. Number two, web services, web design and development. Number three, SEO and SEM, kind of what you'd expect. But then we see some things like uh, number seven here, people that are looking for employment and people that are looking for career consulting services. So that was helpful for me in learning, hey, there's people here who are looking for training, they're looking to learn new skill sets. And that's helped me think a little bit differently about the kinds of content that I produce on the website, trying to be able to serve those people as well. So you can learn all of that stuff from Google Analytics. You can see where your traffic comes from. This is also, the root and branch website. You can see here, small font there, but over this time period in question, 85.17% of all users came from Google organic search. This will help to prioritize, hey, what's really the most important? Maybe help us spot some opportunities if there are channels or traffic sources that should be important but aren't. They can clue us in that, hey, that might be a place to invest. We can see our top performing organic search queries. This is from Google Search Console data, which is different from Google Analytics, but you can plug those two things in so you can see your Search Console data within Analytics. What are the organic search queries that you are ranking for? Where are you ranking? How many impressions are there? How many clicks? This is just sorted by impressions here. So you can see local SEO has the most impressions during this time frame in Google Organic Search. What are backlinks, another SEO kind of term, SEO writing for sure, and then also some Google Analytics kind of stuff. So Google Analytics, number seven, Universal Analytics, number 13. And we can start to use this to learn more about how Google is seeing our site, and again, spot opportunities for growth. We can see our top performing pages, ranked by page views, by the average time that users spend on our site. We can measure our site speed. This is in the behavior reporting section of Universal Analytics. So for this specific situation, uh, I had changed hosting for the Root and Branch website, and the new host was help make the website be faster. And we can see the result of that as page load time had decreased after the hosting change was implemented. You can also track events, things like scrolling activity, video plays, link clicks, any downloads. This stuff does require a little additional configuration, 
but you can start to see not just total scrolls or link clicks or video starts, but when you click into those things, you can see more of them, like video starts, which specific videos were played, what pages were users on when they played them, how long did they watch the video, all that kind of stuff that helps you understand your customers more and your website. You can configure and record your most important conversions. Conversions are also something that takes a little bit of additional configuration work, but this is one of the most important things to do in your Google Analytics account. What we're looking at here are contact page form submissions on the root and branch site. So during this time period in question, you can see there are four of them where each of those little spikes are showing up. If you look down um, towards like the bottom part of the screen, you will see the contact page form submission was just over a quarter of a percent at 0.28%. So you can measure those conversion rates over time and you can understand where the traffic came from that drove those conversions, all sorts of things that will help you get more of those and more most important conversion actions in the future. If you're an e-commerce site, you can measure your e-commerce conversion efficiency with enhanced e-commerce tracking. This is a website that's an e-commerce site, not the root and branch site. Um, and during this time frame, there were 345 sessions on the site. Of those 345, 105 had no shopping activity at all. So just somebody came to the site, didn't even look at any product pages, um, but 239 of those sessions did include at least one product page view. Of those 239, 211 never added a product to the shopping cart, but 29 sessions did include an add to cart event. None of those carts were abandoned. They all entered the checkout phase. You can see that 29 sessions with checkout and then 16 of those checkouts were abandoned, leaving us with 13 sessions with a completed transaction. And then in that small font there in light gray, you can see that gives us a 3.77% conversion rate, e-commerce conversion rate. So if we were to be able to say, get that e-commerce conversion rate from about a four to about a 6%, that would be a 50% increase in our conversion rate that let's leave aside for a second the fact that that would probably be unrealistic to do. But if you could do that, that would increase your revenue by 50%. So it works throughout this whole conversion funnel here. If we're able to say, get more people to add product views, if we're able to convert more of those people into people who are gonna add something to our cart, maybe by doing some testing with um, add to cart button color or calls to action, all of that will flow through our e-commerce conversion funnel and can make us more money. And we can measure all of this with Google Analytics. So what's new for 2022 with Google Analytics? There's a new type of Google Analytics. Google Analytics 4 is the new default version of Analytics, while the prior version, called Universal Analytics, currently, my opinion, still has better tracking capabilities. What's not new, it remains free and available for businesses with the interest and the capacity to use it. Um, most people, what I'm doing, what I'm recommending any business that I work with do in 2022 is to use both Universal Analytics and Google Analytics 4. Put some links in the description to how to set that up. And there's also a, yeah, I'll put a little card that'll pop in here where you can hit another link to, to watch that if you want to get started with that. So who it's for and who it's not for? Who's Google Analytics for? Any business that uses a website to help sell to customers or to educate and connect with prospects. The more important your website is in your overall business, the more you might want to consider using Google Analytics because that data has the potential to be so much more meaningful for you. But it's not for everybody. If you don't have the time or there's no one on your team who has the time or interest to spend using in analysis with Google Analytics, it's, you probably, you aren't gonna get much from Google Analytics. I would say, honestly, just pass on it until that situation changes. That's because 
the data won't really help you much at all if you don't have the capacity to actually analyze and use it. But if you want to get started, you can head over to analytics.google.com and create an account. You'll see something like that. You'll need a website, a Gmail or Google linked email address, and a way to get the tracking code on your site. You can, if you have a web developer that you work with, that's often a great way to do it. If you use a platform like Shopify or Wix or Squarespace, there are some built-in integrations that you can use. If you use Google Tag Manager, you can push it to the site through Google Tag Manager. There's lots of ways to do this. Again, check the links in the description for some guides on, on those different platforms. And from there, if you have it already running, consider taking the next step. So set up conversion tracking for your site, things like form fills or calls. What are those important conversion actions? You can also learn more about GA4 versus Universal Analytics. Put a link in the description to a comparison of those two property types. And then there's some advanced tracking capabilities you can implement as well. We've got seven things you should do with Google Analytics in 2022 linked in the comments. All right, number three. What is the third way that Google can help small businesses in 2022? It's Google Ads, the largest advertising platform in the world. So when you're in Google Ads, if you go to create a new campaign, a new advertising campaign, you'll see the option to build a search campaign, which is the original kind of Google Ads campaign type. That's why Google was Google Ads was initially launched as Google AdWords. It's those, you know, those text ads that you see on the Google SERP. You can also run display ads, digital banner ads, across 90% of the internet with Google Ads. You can run shopping ads. So if you have an e-commerce site, you you do need a linked Google Merchant Center account, but you can run product ads for your website through Google. And you can run video ads if you have a linked YouTube account. But everybody can run these two. You don't need a Merchant Center account or you don't need a YouTube account to be able to run search and display ads. Let's look at some examples. Here's a display ad or a banner ad. This is on ESPN.com. You can see that old belly ad there at the top of the page. There's another ad right there for Vanguard. That's also a display banner ad. These things cost about half a cent on average to serve. They're targeted not so much to someone saying, hey, I want to advertise on ESPN, but they're targeted to the actual user profile, the demographics, the interests, the audience profile of someone who's browsing. That targeting is set up in the Google Ads platform. And then regardless of whether the user's on ESPN or Sports Illustrated.com or Fox News or CNN or New York Times, they'll be eligible to see your ads. Uh, here's a search ad, right? So search ads only available to show on the Google search engine results page in response to specific search terms or keywords that you are bidding on as an advertiser. Two very different types of ad advertising. So with display advertising, they show up on sites other than Google but they're not gonna show up on social media platforms, right? Facebook, they have their own advertising platform. Same thing for Twitter, for TikTok, et cetera. But basically everything else. Very high reach potential. You can set up really broad targeting if you want to and reach everybody. They don't have to be searching for something. You can say, hey, I wanna target everybody in this demographic, in this geography. Low cost per user. Remember, about half a cent maybe on average to serve one of these ads. They're designed to help create awareness. These Think of these kind of like the billboards of the internet. You know, they're effective sometimes in grabbing attention um, and they're not so effective at say, getting someone to stop exactly what they're doing to click through an ad and take a conversion action. But to help raise awareness for someone, they can be very effective. And we just need to have managed expectations, not expecting that a ton of people are going to take action immediately on the ads. These are paid for on an impression basis. That's something called CPM pricing. So you might say if you 
had a cost per thousand impressions. That's what CPM stands for, cost per thousand of five dollars. That would mean you're paying five bucks for every thousand times your ad shows. It's kind of in the, the range of what you might pay and that would work out to half a cent per single impression. Search on the other hand, very different. They show up on the Google SERP, that's where your search ads will show, relatively low reach. Our, our reach is gonna be limited based on the keywords we're bidding on, right? So in, in the example in the bottom right, if someone's not searching for buy gold belly, if that's the only keyword we're bidding on, we're not gonna be able to show our ad. It's limited based on our keyword targeting. Relatively high cost per user. So display ads low cost per user, search ads high cost per user, and that's because these are bottom of the funnel kind of prospects. We want to generate a conversion, generate a sale, generate a new email subscriber, generate a new um, lead for our sales team to talk to, and there's a higher likelihood of customer action. Why? It's because the customers, they're telling us what they want at the moment that they're searching Google for it. And we have the opportunity to bid on those keywords and create really compelling ads and landing pages to help address what they're looking for. Unlike display ads, which are paid for on an impression basis, we only pay for search ads when a click happens. From somewhere, let's think about like 250 to 350 that you might pay per click. It does vary by industry, but yeah, somewhere around three bucks a click is not crazy to think about. When we think about the marketing funnel, at the top of the funnel, we have awareness where a potential audience initially becomes exposed to a new product or service or company. Middle of the funnel, engagement or education where prospects learn more about the company and its products or services through research. And then at the bottom of the funnel, we have conversions, where customers come out of the bottom of the funnel and turn into leads or revenue or money. That's kind of this user journey process in a simplified view. So when we think about Google Ads in the funnel, at the top of the funnel, we have display advertising. Again, high reach, low cost per user, creating awareness. We're not expecting much in terms of customer action to come from that. And then at the bottom of the funnel, we have our search advertising with low reach, high cost per user, where we really want to create a conversion and we're willing to bid on it. So with Google Ads, what's new in 2022? Well, Google Ads continues to shift in the direction of automation. So all the new tools, all the new features that Google is rolling out, they are allowing advertisers to turn more and more control over to Google. So Google wants that, right? Um, and hopefully, it, it's allowing advertisers to continue to get good results um, and not needing to spend as much time manually managing campaigns. So if Google can have great automated tools that can help manage our campaigns for us and we can still get good results, that's a win for us, that's a win for Google. We know since Google's the one calling the shots, it's definitely gonna be a win for Google. Um, so advertisers who are learning about these new tools can learn and validate whether it's going to allow them to continue to get good results from Google Ads as well. What's not new? Google operating out of its own self-interest. So advertisers that understand that and understand their business fundamentals can generate positive ROI from Google Ads. It's the largest advertising platform in the world. It's a great advertising platform, it has lots of flexibility, still lots of great options that advertisers can use. So who's it for? Any business that has these three things. One, a clear understanding of marketing goals. You should know if your primary objective is to drive awareness, drive traffic, or drive leads before you can use Google Ads properly. If you don't know that, you're not gonna even know, hey, should I be running display ads in addition to search ads? Should I be doing exclusively one or the other? You need to know your goals. You need to know a clear understanding of customer value. For example, let's say you're doing a Google Ads search campaign. It's not going to help you to acquire new cust customers at $150 each if a new customer is only worth $100 to you. It's a great way to burn $50 a customer. So you need to know what that customer is worth to you so you can use that information in setting up your Google Ads campaign and then measuring it and tracking it and optimizing it accordingly. 
Finally, you must have a budget that you're willing to spend. $300 per month might be a fine way to get in at the ground floor and test something that can ramp up to thousands or tens of thousands for businesses that are getting good results. But if you're not willing to spend at least a few hundred dollars to test it out, I would say it's not worth it to try to get in there with 50 bucks or 100 bucks because you're just not going to have enough data to understand if it's actually working for you or not. Who is it not for? Well, if you don't have all three of those things above, you're a business that will likely not have success with Google Ads. And additionally, this is just kind of like a marketing 101 basics here, but if you don't have a clear way to communicate your value proposition relative to your competitors, Google Ads, or really any advertising, is it's going to be a tough, tough way for you to make money. Well, let's say you're a flooring business, right, and you have three competitors in a five mile radius, your ads can't come down to flooring business, we sell floors, right? There needs to be a way to communicate. How are you different from the competition? How are you better? Your customers have options. Think about what's gonna be really compelling for them. Do you do some kind of like specialized install service? Do you have access to different brands that your competitors don't have? Do you have a longer heritage in the local market than anyone else that translates to helping customers in a meaningful way. Think about that because that's going to need to feature prominently in your calls to action in your ads. So how do you get started if you want to get started? Well, decide if you want to run your own campaigns or hire someone to help. If you want to run your own campaigns, it's a great idea to get certified in Google Ad Search. You can do that by going to skillshop.withgoogle.com. You'll need to log in to an account, so your Gmail or Google linked account, and then you can find classes to learn the fundamentals of Google Ad Search and ultimately take and pass the Google Ad Search assessment. What does that look like? You'll have the opportunity to go through these nine modules here. And as you go through those modules, you'll be learning more about the theory of Google Ads and about how to use it in practice and then you'll pass the exam. From there, take the next step. So start small with a test budget. Use very specific targeting, very specific targeting if it's a search campaign in terms of keywords and match types, specific in terms of geography, specific in terms of any audiences that you might be adding on. Set up conversion tracking. So if you've already done your Google Analytics conversion tracking, you can actually Import those goals, those conversions into Google Ads and have Google Ads look and optimize and track for those conversions. And then see if you can generate conversions at a profitable rate for your business. If you can, it's a great idea to keep doing it. If you can't, again, that's probably a good signal to, um, to not. And then keep learning. There's always new developments, new things being added to the Google Ads platform. And that's true of both Google Ads and digital marketing in general. So thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, feel free to subscribe. There'll be more videos like this about Google Ads, Google Analytics, SEO, ways to learn about digital marketing and help your business grow. Thanks for watching. Have fun out there.